Sorry. Immense pleasure to welcome you to the e-tailing IBM CXO Roundtable Meet. Our presenting partner is IBM. This CXO Roundtable Meet will focus on the topic connecting with tomorrow's customers today. The attendees through this Roundtable Meet will get to know the latest developments in digital marketing, best practices, emerging strategies and user insights from successful digital marketing campaigns generated in the recent past. Now I would like to call Mr. Ashish Jalani, founder of India's largest e-commerce knowledge platform, Etailing India. Ashish graduated from NYU Stern School of Business and worked as a retail expert for Kurt Salmon in the New York office where he helped clients such as Home Depot, Sarah Lee Apparels, Tiffany and Company, Philips Van Heusen, divide their market strategy and operations. Ashish is also the co-founder of MySolitaire.com in the US, ICB that is Indian School of E-Business, IEC Indian in Entrepreneurs Club and is also closely associated with several ventures as an advisor and mentor. And now, to formally welcome all of you with his opening remarks, please join me in welcoming Ashish Jalani to the stage. Good morning, everyone. Right. We're all ready to begin. Um, again, I think the topic is very interesting. Um, how do we connect with uh, tomorrow's customer today? Um, I think maybe the topic should have been, um, how do we connect with today's customer today? Because I think it's not tomorrow anymore. A lot of these customers have already started changing their mindset. Um, and they're already looking for uh, different ways uh, that marketeers um, want to present their products and services to them. So I think today it's going to be an interesting few hours. Uh, we have uh, a keynote session, uh, followed by the keynote session. We'll have a panel discussion. Uh, panel discussion is going to be a few people from different industries, actually. So a lot of insights we were just discussing, so a lot of insights that they will provide. So why don't we um, get started very quickly. Um, and let me welcome uh, Tim Okil. Uh, Tim Okil is uh, from IBM. And he's the IBM World Marketing Strategist and NSME. And he's going to be delivering our keynote address. So can we please welcome Tim, please? OK, well, we're going to take about 30 minutes. And we're going to talk out loud about um, a lot of things that are going on in the, uh, in the world of marketing, which is a pretty phenomenal tone on right now. Um, and it's going to be going on for the next certainly several years. What's happening right now is we're just scratching the surface. Uh, but real quick, just to show of hands, I, everybody that's involved in marketing, I mean, just a show of hands, just so I knew we've got the audience. Okay. Um, I was a CMO for a, uh, for a manufacturing brand. It was uh, B2C. Sold through retail. Um, it was a Durables Good mattresses. Uh, in fact, I spent a lot of time in India um, with that product that we launched here. It was the Simmons Company. Um, I spent time at retail, uh, $2 billion retailer in the US, 2,000 locations. Um, spent time on consumer packaged goods. But all in all, was a CMO for about uh, nine years, which certainly went beyond the lifespan of a, of a normal CMO. A lot of private equity managed companies. Uh, anybody knows anything about private equity? It's a real meat grinder, um, but I, I figured out how to how to be able to play within that game, um, and a lot of it had to do with data dri driven decision making. Is really what that was all about, and ironically enough, it's it's where the category is all gone. And um, we're going to talk about all of us. I mean, in terms of um, how we all have kind of continued in our career, and then what's going to need to happen next. Okay, and a lot of it is is what's emerging right now and the tools that are available. And so let's dive into that. Um, these are some of the things we're talking about. It's just the dynamic changes that are going on in marketing, and they are dynamic. In fact, dynamic is actually an understatement for what's going on. Um, we're going to talk about some of the retail industry challenges, but we're going to talk about, this is just as marketing as a whole, so don't think about it as just retail only. There's just some retail examples, because they're really good. Because whatever we're doing, I don't care what category, if you're selling, if it's B2B or it's B2C, it, it, the dynamics are still the same. We've got to sell a product. We've got to get somebody to say yes, I'm going to give you money for what you're selling, okay? It doesn't matter what it is. So we'll talk about that one. We'll talk about the experience with solutions. A lot of new ones there. Shreeman's going to talk a little bit about some of the new things that have been introduced. We're going to talk about the why IBM, and then um, a couple case studies along the way. Now, um, I love this slide because it's such an understatement, <laughs> okay? 
Uh, marketing isn't just being remade. It, it, it's not just evolving. It is a full-blown revolution. Okay, it is a turn it upside down on its head and change the world kind of thing that's going on. Because we as marketers use traditional tools, right? It, <coughs> TV and radio, collateral, point of sales, a lot of the, a lot of that, you know, kind of stuff that we started our careers in. It's now all morphing, as we all know, right? Because we, it's all about that experience we can have with the consumer. That's one to one. It's back and forth, right? And I'll give you some crazy examples that I've gotten a chance to see because I'm in a unique spot that I get to travel around the world and meet with a lot of the great brands in the world. But I also get a chance to see a lot of these small little emerging brands that are doing amazing things with no money, right? And we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on there. Um, so first, the dynamic changes are really in the broadness of the complexity that's now in marketing. Okay? It has become vastly more complex than it was when we first started our careers. I started my career in the advertising agency business, right? And it was all about me writing creative briefs, and we create an ad, and we put it in the newspaper. Those days are gone. I mean, it's like ancient history. It's a whole new ballgame, right? We don't do anything creatively until we know that there's a data-driven decision-making piece that's going to tell us what to go do creatively, right? And it's all about, I, used to, I like to use the word compass heading with my, with my marketing teams. It's like, let's get the compass heading. We're going north, south, east, or west. Let's figure that out, and then let's go be creative in that, that, in that avenue. I was with a very, very large worldwide brand several weeks ago, and um, they made a comment. They said, we chase every idea. And I went, that is such a shame, because you are chasing north, south, east, and west, just go figure out go figure out which direction and then go chase all the ideas. But the amount of time and energy that they are wasting by not getting a general compass heading and chasing all the ideas is just a massive waste of time. And they ultimately regard themselves as, a, as an unorganized herd in their marketing department. Just a bunch of people moving in direction, right? Not in an organized fashion. So let's talk about what's going on in the world of the of the of all of us, right? It's, there is so much, there are so many tools and so much information, we can't grab it fast enough, right? And so what we're hearing, by and large, is, is that as time has gone, this is a study went from 2011 to 13, the 50, 2015 study is about to come out, but what happened was is that over time, um, CMOs and marketing professionals felt like they were underprepared as time went on. It didn't mean that we weren't chasing it and trying to figure it out, it's just that a whole new sets of capabilities came out. New inventions were created in the marketing world. We had to go understand that. Okay. So what's happening is, is that we know there's, a, I mean, as marketers, a lot of complexity. We got to figure out what it is that we need to go grab a hold of and learn it as quick as we possibly can. But it's growing at an exponential pace. Okay. So and the tools that are being created, right? It started as just kind of email, then it evolved into mobile, and now it's evolving into social. It's full, Falling into lots of different things, and we're just scratching the surface in terms of the tools <laughs> that we're going to ultimately end up having that's going to allow us to have a conversation with consumers. Don't know where it's coming from, don't know which direction. We just need to deal with Facebook last week, and Sherman's going to talk a little bit about some of these things a little bit. But it's, it's wherever it is that consumers are engaging, we're going to go grab a hold of it. Okay? And that's what it's all about. The consumer's guiding us on where we need to go, and they're telling us where they're making decisions. So that's what it's all about. So we've got to, on our side, we got to keep a very, very keen eye on what's going on in the market and how people are engaging. I'll give you some interesting examples here in a minute with some virgin brands. Um, and it's these ones right here. So what's really interesting is the, the speed at which brands are now entering the market. It is happening now at a pace that is faster than we have ever seen in the history of commerce. Okay? And I want to give you an interesting set of examples. This is a US-based example. But this is true, really, worldwide, okay? So, in the U.S., these four brands entered the market this year, okay? These are mattress brands. Now, what's really interesting about mattresses, it's a durable's purchase, okay? Durable's purchase, you know what makes a, what makes a durable's purchase unique versus a package good purchase? Anyone want to venture a guess? Length of time of the purchase. Okay? Tires, refrigerators, dishwashers, mattresses, long cycle, right? Long cycle. So long cycle products require the consumer to be educated. Okay? They're not going to go in and just buy. They're going to go in and they're going to do research. Okay? And it's a, it's and it's a, you tend to become very brand loyal.
because you don't want to have to go through that education process. So just an example, these four brands invented themselves this year and entered what is in the U.S. a $14 billion category. Brand new, okay? They're less than a year old. It's a completely different model because they're not using traditional marketing. They're not cutting TV spots. They're not doing radio ads. They're not doing billboards. not doing any of that stuff. They're using strictly digital strategies. What's fascinating is, is in less than a year, they picked up 1% share of the market of a 14, or 140 million, those four in less than a year. And they are on a trajectory that looks like this, okay? They're going to be 2%, 3%, and 4%, and 5, I mean, they're going to keep growing, okay? So the fact of the matter is, is that anybody, let's say, we all had a great idea right now that we want to go out and market. We could enter the category just like that, okay? And there's lots of products that are doing it. It's the beauty behind digital, okay? Is that it's a, the ROI is extremely high, the cost of entry is very low, and allows you to target consumers very quickly. These guys have figured it out. The direct to consumer guys, because they're very lean, right? Figured it out very quickly. So, let's talk about the consumer a little bit, okay? The consumer has fundamentally changed. They want to be involved. It's not, you know, traditional marketers, I see this a lot. I've heard this. I've heard, I've heard CMOs say, I don't, want to, I don't want to engage in social media with my consumer because they might say something bad about me, okay? That has been said, and my response is always the same. I say, you better believe they are. They are going to say something bad about you, but they're also going to say great things about you. But the opportunity is, I actually think the, the greatest opportunities happen when people say bad things about the brand. Because it gives you the opportunity to come back and have a conversation with not only that person, but everybody else that's reading it. And they go, my gosh, you're a great guy. Look at that, you came back and helped solve that consumer's problem. I really like you. Okay? Now, this is the other thing about brands that's happening. Is that it used to be that to become a trusted brand, it took years. And it took years of people having to engage with the brand and have experience with the brand. Those days are over. You don't have to do that anymore. Okay? We are all, all of us are making decisions in this room because we can go onto a social network or we can see a comment that was made online or we can see different things, see a blog. And we're going we're gonna to gift them. We're going to say, you know what? Because they said good things about that brand because my friend that I'm linked to on whatever social network said a nice thing, you know what? That brand's okay with me. I'm going to consider buying it. Okay? Unheard of. So the speed in terms of creating loyalty, like those brands I showed you, what's amazing is those brands didn't exist before, and they create an affinity for their brand in, overnight. There are people buying those products that never, ever, I mean, they're going on and seeing, seeing a site and having experience and buying it. Okay? Overnight. There is, no, there is no multiple touch points of experience, right? Over time. Now, let's talk about us as CMOs, which is really interesting is, is that we're going to talk about how our brains work, okay? Because our brains on the marketing side work different than, than a lot of the other functional areas within the companies. But we are responsible for brand strategy, okay? It's the way we think. Uh, we are also now getting, getting um, focused more on very clear goals and KPIs. Why? Because they cannot be measured. It used to be that my CEO used to say to me, he said, Tim, you know, I know I, only half of the marketing is working, but I'm not sure which half, right? Now, we can get, they, CEOs can hone in more in terms of making CMOs and marketing departments more accountable because of the data side. Clearly, the role that the CMO is going to be playing on the, cent, on the, on the executive leadership team, the central strategic team, whatever you want to call it, okay, is going to, is elevating, I mean, at a massive level. If anybody heard about what happened at McDonald's, they replaced their CEO back in December, you know who they replaced him with? Their chief brand officer, okay? We're going to see a whole lot more of that. It's because the marketing individual, everybody in this room, you get great visibility of what's going on in the market. You're kind of like the guy in the tower at the airport. You're like the air traffic controller. You can see everything that's going on because of the data that we now got our, our hands on. And then the skill sets. Our skill sets have got to expand. And I'm going to touch on that piece um, right now. And uh, it comes down to this slide, okay? A majority of us, okay, skew. Who else familiar with left and right brain thinking? You ever heard of this, the concept of left and right brain? Okay. Right is, the right side of your brain is creative dominant, and it's emotional, right? It's, it's where, you know, uh, it's why a lot, of, a lot of us ended up in the spots we ended up in, because we we're really good at shit, throwing out ideas, solving, we can go to the dry erase board and draw stuff out, okay? Left brain is analytic, right? It's very processed, right? CFOs, CFOs very operations guys, very process driven, okay? What's happening is, is that we are primarily, and I'll tell you, I skew right, 
I skew right, I had to develop my left brain. I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and I developed fact-based decision-making models to help me, be, help me focus my creativity and the team's creativity. But what happens is, in a majority of cases, is marketing individuals tend to skew right, just tend to skew right. What's happening is the tools that are coming, that are becoming available, okay, all the data-driven stuff, it's all left brain stuff, it's process, right? And so we as marketers have got to make sure that we're developing both sides of our brain, okay? And that's really all, it's just to be aware of that and to just to be able to make fact-based decisions, right? Uh, I've been sat in plenty of board meetings where I've seen board members say, that is a great idea, but tell me why you did that, right? Just give me the why, give me the reasons. It's all they're going to, and we're going to start to hear more and more of that. We're going to hear that conversation elevate back to the why. It's all because of what's going on in that left brain, okay? So let's keep that in mind. But I also tell you, um, great teams are built out of a combination of left and right brain thinkers. Okay, having data analytics folks within your departments that are working with your creative functions, very very key, right? And if you look at the history, I mean, companies over time are, are just littered with stories of great management teams. You know, Tim Cook and Steve Jobs at Apple. I mean, very clearly one left, one right. Okay, we can go through lots of examples. Not the purpose of this conversation, but I just want you all to be aware of it. Okay. Um, real quick, just so you can see how CMOs categorize themselves um, out of the CMO study that we do, just so you're aware. 37% of CMOs consider themselves traditionalists. Okay? Those are the folks that are still doing radio, newspaper, they have not jumped into the digital world yet. Next group, 30%, consider themselves social strategists. Okay? I think those, those are the folks that play Facebook and WhatsApp and all that kind of stuff, have it's really ventured beyond that. Another 33% consider themselves digital pace setters. Got it, they're on rails. They're doing digital you know, every day, and it's a dominant part of the program. But what's interesting is, when you ask the question if they're ready for the data explosion, that number has decreased 38% over time. So they've actually gotten less prepared, sort of like what we said earlier. So I would tell you that 33% of the market aren't digital pace setters. Okay? And I get asked the question, and everybody will say, I'm, we're behind. Right? We're behind in, in, our, in our digital journey and our platforms. No, no. Very few people are really behind. Okay? If you're engaged, you're sitting in this room, you're not behind. Okay? Um, but just let you kind of know kind of where things are out in the world. All right? um, so let's talk about some of the um, two great facts here. And this is about consumers that are engaging online. Okay? Is that your in-store purchase decision is driven 52% of the time by what they do online. The fact of the matter is, is your brand now is an online brand. That's how you are being presented to the world. Okay? And a consumer is going to make a decision whether or not to intend to buy you based on what, how you're presenting yourself online. The other thing is, is an interesting fact here, is that the vast majority of consumers are, going to share, are, going to, are willing to share that experience online. Okay? That's why when anybody says to me they're going to avoid getting involved, it's, 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 it's foolish. It's absolutely foolish. Because you're missing the opportunity to take, to turn, as we say in the, in the States, turn a lemon into lemonade. Okay? And that's when somebody may not may say favorable things, but also the opportunity for people to say favorable things and that to be exposed to the world. So, very, very big deal to change the world for us. Now, the other thing is this, is that consumers want to be involved um, and engaged. And it's one of the myths that I hear. I'll hear from, you know, some um, very some older school traditional marketers and I go no I, I, consumers don't want me to bother right no consumers really do want you to bother okay as long as what you're delivering is relevant okay people will take the emails and they're not going to unsubscribe they're going to take the mobile bits and they're not going to unsubscribe as long as it's relevant okay but they want to be engaged the fact of the matter is they're going to post about you okay they want to do that um, they want to get they, they expect to get personalized promotions and offers expect it Right. Um, we know they're influenced by, by friends, and, friends and family, but they're willing to give you virtually anything except medical information. Okay? So consumers want to be engaged. The whole idea of crowdsourcing and crowdfunding that's going on right now, it's all because consumers just want to be engaged. I saw a, um, has anybody heard of this, this product called Flowhive? Have you heard about this? Craziest thing. So it's, um, somebody in Australia has invented a new beehive. It's a beehive, and all it does is, is it doesn't you don't 
have to go and, I guess, smoke it and wear a big net over your head to keep the bees from stinging you. You just go and turn on a spigot on the, on, the, on the hive and it starts pouring honey out into a jar for you. Okay? They crowdsourced and got $50 million and they have got a number of followers that are in the tens of thousands. There are tens of thousands of beekeepers in the world. Okay? And what they're doing is getting people who are just fundamentally interested in what's going on in the technology. So we're going to see this over and over where people are going to get involved and engaged in things that you wouldn't think they'd want to get engaged in, but it's all because it became a very interesting experience for them. Okay? So let's talk about some of the key issues that are keeping people up at night. Um, I got a phone call from a, a CEO friend of mine. Um, he manages a, uh, a $2 billion retailer with 2,000 retail locations. And he said, um, Tim, I just saw my online sales. I don't know whether to be scared to death or thrilled. Okay? Now, he's scared because he's got 2,000 retail locations. And what he doesn't know is they'll just become a giant boat anchor, boat anchor on his balance sheet. Okay? Does he have obsolete locations? And I said, no, you know what, if you're able to harness both of them, it actually becomes a massive advantage. But the fact of the matter is, is that anybody that's, that's selling <coughs> offline, okay, has got, is it about me having to move to online, okay? Or is it me against them? Is it me as an offline retailer against what's going on online? The fact of the matter is that the opportunity is really right here. It's to combine both, okay? is if you've got brick and mortar locations or you've got exposure to consumer in a drive time area as well as online, it's a great combination as long as you can harness them. Okay? But it takes, it's, it's going to take a concentrated effort of how the two work together. Okay? Now, the basics of marketing have not changed. They have not changed at all. How we execute against the basics has. It's fundamentally changed. Okay? It is still about, if we've got a product, we've got to tell people about it. Right? We've got to generate awareness. We've got to deliver it in a way where we, incur, we, where we drive purchase intent. Okay? And what I tell, and I sit on a board right now uh, of, a, of a company, and I said, you know, it's, it's the, you got to define what the cost of entry for the category is. Okay? Don't stand for those because the, the, the buyer already assumes you own, you own those. What you want to go stand for are the things that drive purchase intent. Right? It's the things that you can own that somebody goes, you know what? I want to go look at this guy, okay? Whether you got a beehive company or whatever, whatever you have, okay? But it's all about driving, using the using the words and the phrases to drive purchase intent and then ultimately conversion when it's all going together, okay? So those have not changed at all. It's just the tools that we now have got available to us to go drive this. It's fundamentally changed. We've got email, we've got mobile, we've got um, social, we've got all kinds of things available and there's more coming down the road. These fundamentals have not changed. For the first time ever, and I don't know, um, you know, how many, you know, folks in this room on your brands, how often you're doing research. In my world, I was doing a segmentation study once every two years. Okay, and I was making decisions on my brands for two years based on that one segmentation study. Okay, those days are gone. They're over. They're over. Now, we know instantly when somebody liked it, they shared it, they viewed it, they bought it, they. They convert it. We know that stuff instantly. So what we can now do is we can segment our audiences every minute of every day. And so one of the questions I got earlier was, you know, what is it as you know, as marketers that I see that that, that that differentiate marketers? And it's merchandising strategy is really where it comes down to. If you've got the ability to create a product line that goes from good, better to best. Because our, our, our job as marketers is always to drive the consumer and give them the opportunity to spend more money. Okay? And it's all about creating that good, better, best strategy, whatever that is. Okay? And we now know that. We can now figure out how well those strategies are working because we're seeing real time online how consumers are behaving. Okay? So. so, let's talk about this one. This is a biggie. One of the hardest things in marketing to do, and I think we all agree, is creating continuity and consistency from execution to execution. As we create our brands, you know, in the old school, traditional marketing, where somebody had to go in and physically cut and paste or design something, it never failed. There was something that made it different than the way we presented the brand, right? 
it just and, it, and you'd always see it like when it was in print or it was in broadcast. You're like, oh my god, <laughs> why did that? How did they get through? The, the logo looks different or whatever. I've been on brands I worked on, and all of a sudden you saw a dealer run. I saw I've seen a dealer run ads on my brand, and he used a logo that was 20 years old. Right? It was just a complete the consumer looked at it and said, that's not the same brand that we're selling today, right? And so what we want to be able to do is create tons of continuity and consistency across every point of touch to make sure that that brand becomes as familiar to that consumer as possible. Okay? It is far easier with the digital platforms today because once you create the platform, okay, it is now, it's, it's now down, right? There's not, there's not much room for human error to step in and make something that doesn't have a lot of continuity and consistency to it. Okay? So I think this is one of the huge wins in the world of marketing. People always laugh at this. They go, well, you know, that's not so hard. I say, well, you know, so I start giving examples, right? And it was, you know, Ford, you know, there was a Ford ad, and they used a typeface that was different, right? And it didn't look like the Ford car anymore. It was something different, right? And so continuity is a really big deal. You know, the words that we use, the phrases that we use, it's like Apple. Can you imagine Apple computer all of a sudden moving away from a minimalist look? Can you imagine them doing a cluttered ad? No, never, never, right? There's a very specific look at which they've created for the brand, just as everybody in this room has done. You've created a brand standard for your brands in terms of the way that they present themselves, okay? And keeping that, keeping, keeping that consistent is critical because it, it, it allows you to not waste money, okay? All right. So, um, I don't... Didn't put this up here for y'all to be able to read all these, but uh, I want to explain kind of what's going on here. Um, is as the digital platform started to evolve, what we all knew was was we had to get involved. We had to start to bring in different players. And so what's happened is is all these guys with these orange and gray blocks. <coughs> in that are all the different companies that now serve those markets, whether it's SEO, whether it's SEM, whether it's asset management, creative design, testing. Um, social, video marketing, whatever, they're all up there, okay? And so what we did was, is we started to work with maybe an email marketing team, right? And then we said, well, you know what, let's bring an SEM guy in. And then we had an SEO guy. Um, what starts to happen, I think we've all been there, is we start humming. And we get on the platform, we start adding additional services. Sometimes it's not the same guy, but they're, they're different services. Invariably happened to me, I don't know if you all have experienced this, is one of those suppliers will always pull me aside and say, hey, Tim, I can, I can do what they're doing, right? Well, the minute I hear that, it means, guess what? You two are no longer playing well together. You're not going to share information with him, and they're not going to share it with you because you want each other's business. So what's happened is, is that we've moved into a day and age where what we don't want to do as marketing departments is bring in a ton of complexity. Okay? Complexity is now the enemy. Because you can't manage, if you're starting to develop that marketing platform and you bring in somebody from here, 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 and here, you've got five different suppliers you now have to manage and make sure that all the information is talking. Okay? That becomes a very difficult situation to manage. <coughs> for smaller companies, fine. But for, if you're trying to develop a larger platform, what you, what you end up moving to our point is right here. It's that word right here. It's the platform suite approach. And it's the one-stop shop. Right? It's, I know I can bring in the guy that's going to data manage, I'm going to bring in the guy that can be able to create the offer program, and then also be able to go out and execute. That right there becomes the key to reducing complexity. Okay? We're in that category, so others are in the category, but it's been birthed because of the amount of confusion and a lot of the complexity in managing multiple suppliers within your, uh, within your departments. So just want to make a quick note on that, because I have lived, I've seen that movie a couple times, and it's, uh, it's no fun. But the, but the hard, hardest part of that is, is that you end up bringing suppliers early on that start to understand your company. And they start to understand you as a manager. And they can finish your sentence for you, right? And that's a great thing. Now, whether, but, but keeping five suppliers is a very difficult thing. And so one is it's sort of like uh, it's a saying, you can't keep, can't keep all the puppies, right? You can't keep, you got to give some of the puppies away. So, Anyway, that's something to keep in mind as you start to develop the platforms. You want to make it easy on yourself. Okay. So let's talk about some of the stuff I've seen on the retail side. And this one's really interesting is, is that right now there's a lot of, and I, I've been in dozens and dozens of, of, of meetings 
they are not the same meeting twice. I've never been at the same meeting twice. They're always different. And they're different for a lot of reasons. It's because we're, we're all starting to grow with this new digital platforms. Um, and how we're servicing them, the issues we have, the questions we have are all different from everybody. Whether you're Nike, whether you're McDonald's, whether you're Walmart, it doesn't matter. Your issues are fundamentally different. Um, and you're in, different, you're in a different role, a different spot in your, in your journey. Okay, so here's something, there's a company, who, does any, are you all familiar with fly fishing? Fly, it's a style of fishing? Okay, it's a style of fishing, um, done in the U.S., North America, and it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's kind of an art, uh, the way it's done, but I won't get into too much detail, but there's been a, a retail chain that has come out of this, this fishing style, right? And they were very fragmented, they started off as kind of this, 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 fishing retailer, but now they've emerged into apparel and lifestyle products and all kinds of things. But what was interesting was, is what they did was, is as they brought in their digital platforms, they did something really smart. And we all know that, that, that the heartbeat of the brand beat in the marketing department's chest, right? We all live it, we all live it, if we're in the marketing department. And what they did was, they brought in the tools and had the brand manager managing the data. And so what they became was, was my analogy a little bit earlier, they became the air traffic controller for the brand, as they should be. It wasn't in the it wasn't in the it wasn't in the IT department. It wasn't in you know any other department. It was housed within the marketing department. And they've had some phenomenal growth and phenomenal success out of that. Um, another great example, who else moved Best Buy? You know familiar with Best Buy? Okay, for those that are um, very large electronics retailer in the U.S., if you know what happened in the U.S. and electronics dealers, they're all going out of business. And these guys were gig are gigantic. I mean, in terms of their footprint, it is a quarter of a million dollar or a quarter million square foot to 200,000 square foot um, stores. Gigantic. Um, they were the poster child for the, for the phrase showroom. Everybody went into Best Buy saw the 50 TV sets up on the wall, said, I like that one, let me go home and look for it online and buy it online, okay? And I would tell you that a year ago, if you asked 100 people in the U.S., it was Best Buy gonna be around in a year, everybody would have said, no, they're dead, they're gone. Well, guess what? They came back to lunch. Last March, March, two, two months ago, they set up, they set a 52-week high on their stock price. And they have now started to innovate where now you're seeing kiosks, Best Buy kiosks in airports. They've figured out how to sell inside the store using their, their uh, customer uh, loyalty card. They've done really an amazing job. And what's interesting is when you ask anybody in IBM that worked on the business, they go, it was a train wreck. I mean, it was, a, it was not pretty at all to watch them come out of the mess. But what they did was, is they created, they engaged the consumer, and then they came back and optimized. And they did it over and over and over again to the point where they're gotten pretty good at it. So a year ago, they were, I mean, giving up for dead. Today, they're driving the industry. And they've seen some phenomenal results as they brought on those digital platforms. So um, real quick, um, this is not about one-to-one -one marketing anymore. It's not about I'm going to go deliver a message to the consumer and I'm done. This is back and forth. It is all about experience, OK? I've got a, it's a, it's a continuous engagement cycle, and that's what these tools allow us to do. Um, the tools that we have available today, and these are expanding. Um, I'm going to have Shruman touch on some stuff here in just a minute. But where we are today, this was done, I mean, this is now an outdated slide. This was a slide from uh, several weeks ago after Amplify. That's now expanded. We'll touch on that in a second. Real quick, top 20% um, of digital marketing marketers have got pretty tremendous performance, uh, typically 1.8 times higher on their gross profit. Three and a half times on net income growth, two and a half times higher on stock price. And it's when they do these four things. We tend to break down silos, right? Create simplicity. They maximize the moment. They're, they're seeing information and they're making a decision. They're also delivering omnichannel. So it's not just about one space, it's about multiple spaces. We want to hit the consumer across a wide swath of places where they go and get information. Okay? And then last, it's about measuring results. What worked, what didn't, let's move in the direction of the things that work, and let's make decisions based on that data. Okay. Um, on our side, tons of solutions that we've got. I'm going to hand this over to Shreem and have you stand up real quick and just talk about what happened in Amplify.
sure yeah so uh, thanks to him so far uh, so it's a little, little bit of an overview uh, so we um, just came out of a big event uh, in san diego which is uh, what we call the amplify event where a lot of our products uh, were showcased and we've got some new releases as well um, i think i'm okay you can hear me fine yeah okay. Uh, so, so basically, we look at it as four sub pillars in terms of the overall marketing uh, offerings that we have. One is around the analytics, yeah, and it's really around looking at analytics from a perspective of web analytics, whether it's social analytics, whether it's predictive analytics, whether it's even cognitive analytics. You know, all those aspects of analytics which can help you measure uh, and understand your customer. And then is the marketing side of it, uh, which is the solutions. We're very much focused around uh, helping the marketing managers and the brands uh, in terms of driving more personalized interactions. Yeah? And so this could be right going into the whole aspect of omni-channel marketing, <coughs> just like how do I bring the online and offline together and get a better 360 view of how my customer is and how I can address my customer. Yeah? It can start at a very basic level uh, from a digital perspective of saying, hey, how do I drive marketing automation? And going from there, how can I then leverage some of my analytics to drive more focused marketing around it, and then see how can I now push it towards more channels, whether it is email, SMS, uh, mobile, uh, all these channels, uh, even going to your call centers, uh, you know, all the different channels you can think of. Uh, and then you have commerce, and essentially commerce is where we're saying that the e-commerce aspect of it, how do I kind of leverage the commerce and type it? Our commerce aspects and then the merchandising side to see how I can ensure that from a merchandising side of point, point of view I'm optimized in terms of my categories, optimized in terms of my pricing, in terms of my markdown. Yeah, so that's the aspects of the solution. Yeah. And that's where it's good. And we're gonna have a different conversation a year from now of additional tools that we yes. have. So real quick, and then we need to wrap up here. Um, there are um, some workshops that we've start, we've evolved into uh, being able to do. And one is we started to hear from a lot, a lot of marketing departments of issues that they're having. And so what we did was we created one is we got this, this CMO study, which we're wrapping up now, gives you the opportunity to go through and take part in, in, in some research to ask you your opinions about things. Right? It also gives you, but it'll give you ISA. Um, uh, it gives you kind of a insight into some of the key issues that are being that are being you know kind of dealt with from CMOs around the world. Uh, that's about a 90-minute process. We've done um, marketing workshops. Okay, we'll go down and sit down with you and your marketing teams, and we just go through and talk through what processes you've got in place. You know, um, how are you force ranking offers, etc. And so on. And it's it's very broad. It's a full day. It's all with the full team, and um, these are pretty neat processes to help optimize what you've got going on. Um, enablement, uh, which is really kind of an insight into the category. It's kind of state of marketing, right? We go, we'll go into marketing teams, present and to kind of give insight. Uh, we, hear, we hear from some CMOs that they've got teams that just they're having trouble getting them to get caught up. We've gone in and said, okay, let's tell you what's going on. Okay, this is, this is the train that's leaving the station and you better get on the train. All right, and so we've been able to go in and talk to marketing teams to get them moving. The other thing is on marketing team development, this is really a deep dive on left and right brain, right? It's getting the analytics guys to be appreciated by the creative guys and vice versa. Enjoy what that's all about. So we can come in and do any one of those. Um, real quick on IBM, um, I'm not going to belabor this, but we are, as a company, absolutely dedicated to what we're doing here. Okay? If, we're, if we're not going to greenfield it, we're going to go out and acquire that person that's best in class within that discipline that we need to get into. We don't know what the discipline is going to be next, but we just need to deal with uh, Facebook to start to get into social in a, in a big, big way. Um, and we're going to start to see other, other engagements and other um, 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 acquisitions as we start to see those develop. Um, we also got the number one digital agency in the world. Uh, it's a great kept secret, but we are a large digital agency. Um, ton of spending, ton of R&D. We've got tons of clients across the globe. I'll tell you one of the greatest learners for me has been going around the globe and meeting with some of the 8,000 around the world and having conversations with them about what their issues are. And then lastly, uh, great quote, Thomas Watson, very storied CEO for, uh, for IBM. And this is a great one for marketers because we are very emotional, right? We're very emotional about our brands, um, and we, we uh, they beat our, our hearts. And that's why I pulled this one out. It says, to be successful, you have to have your heart in your business and your business in your heart. Nothing describes marketers better than that, right? It's what we're all about. Okay? 
So anyway, that kind of wraps up what I wanted to walk through. I had 30 minutes to do it. I think we got a couple minutes for Q&A. Um, so I don't know if anybody's got any questions, anything that's sitting on the top of your head. Yes. One of the questions which you talked about, that 1% of the uh, mattresses, emerging brands, yeah. the $14 billion market. Uh, was it distribution uh, strategy brick and mortar, or was it uh, largely through e-commerce? These guys? Yeah. They're, they're direct to consumer. They're going to ship it to you in a box to your front door. So they completely changed the model uh, in terms of the way they deliver it, right? It's sort of like Zappos, right? Zappos came out and said, we're going to send you a whole bunch of shoes and let you send them all back whenever you want to send them back, right? Completely blew up the model. Okay? Another big challenge in the U.S. right now by a lot of the brick and mortar guys. But the fact of the matter is D2C is going to be, we're going to see stuff delivered to your house that you never thought would be delivered to your house. I mean, the fact that there are consumers that are buying cars, silencing, it's going to give you, I mean, gives you a clue. If they're going to buy cars without going and trying the car, then there's a whole lot of, there's a whole lot of less expensive items they're going to have. So. All right, any other questions? Yeah, I have another question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, there's this whole discussion happening about marketing stock, you know, stock being a silo, and there's data all around the, company, right? There's supply yeah. chain data and there's uh, manufacturing data and all right. of that. And there's a lot of conversation about creating one dashboard out of it. That's great. That's a great yeah. question. The question is you got data everywhere, right? So you're gonna have you're gonna have one dashboard or what, what are you gonna have, right? And it's and I'll tell you, I'm seeing lots of different ways that that's being managed. I'm seeing sometimes you also see infighting between the IT department and marketing, right? IT goes, no no it's mine, it's mine. Right? And sometimes the CEO, because the CEO doesn't know CEOs sometimes don't know where marketing analytics has gone, they don't know where the responsibility lies. So the fact of the matter is, is that there is the opportunity for a single for, for a single dashboard on your consumer metrics. There's no question. And I think it goes back to that one chart I showed you. Right? What are the metrics that show you what awareness you've created? You know, what's the other set of metrics that show you where purchase events gone? What people have considered, okay? What would that be? Well, I went to the website. Okay, if I went to the website, then I considered it, right? Because I didn't just go there out of the clear blue sky. I was led there from some other communication, right? Some awareness building, an email campaign, a mobile something, and I went to a site, okay? If I wasn't interested, I wouldn't have gone. So there's lots of ways you can measure that. And it's going to be, but, I think, but, it, but it, it belongs, I believe, it belongs in the house of the marketing guy, okay? The question is, is that a lot of marketing departments don't have don't have a data analytics function in them. Some do. I mean, a lot, a lot do, but there's a lot that don't. Okay, because it's been a CMO, marketing manager, managed function saying we're going to go do this, we're going to go do that. Okay, but with the amount of data that's now available, you know, it's, it's, and you can't do it all, all yourself. I and mean, let's face it, you as a CMO aren't responsible for having for having the answer. You are responsible for mining for them. You have to. Okay. Now, what's going to allow you to mine them? is let me have something I can go mine in the numbers, right? Because a CEO, nothing makes a CEO or an operator more happy when you say, hey, we're going to go build this, and let me tell you why we're going to go do this. Because 68% of consumers said they really wanted to have something look like this. 72% said they really wanted to have red on it, right? Done. We're going to go do this, right? So, yeah. all right. Any other questions? Any questions on your marketing team? Do you get your marketing teams organized to be able to manage this digital revolution that's going on with good data analytics, good creative function? Any concerns there? Okay. All right. Uh, well, also, I'm going to be here. If you have any other questions, um, feel free to come up and ask. Okay. I know we went through a ton of stuff, um, but um, this is a dynamic category. Like I said, it's not an evolution. It is a flat-out revolution that's going on. Anyway, thanks a lot.